I have a couple introductory comments before we get into God's Word. One of which is Sunday mornings I have a bit of a routine. All the little things that I do to get ready, and Jen helps me with many of them. One of which is getting me a thermos full of hot water mixed with honey because I have trouble clearing my throat. Uh, and if you've heard me, sometimes I'm like, <clears throat> you know, trying to do that on a Sunday morning and preach, it's rather difficult. So that helps. And then I'll have in my pocket cough drops or mints. And today I have a little roll of Dutch mints from Roberta. And Roberta is the lady who went home to be with the Lord recently. And reflecting on that, just thinking through the fact that we just finished Revelation not too long ago. And I remember her speaking with me right over by the fellowship hall going, you know, Pastor, Revelation used to confuse me and kind of freak me out. She goes, now it just excites me. I'm excited about what God has for us. And then to think back on one of the last messages she heard in this church is that we've been born again to a living hope. Roberta is in that living hope now. And what an amazing reality to consider this morning. Now, a quick update on my mother-in-law, Colleen. Many of you have been praying for her, uh, her and Jen's dad. So Jen's parents went, were in a motorcycle accident. Her mom suffered uh, frontal lobe damage and uh, serious, serious injuries. She's been in recovery. Uh, please pray for her because they've provided an opportunity for her to go to an inpatient physical therapy and rehab place that's rather intensive. And so they're going to work with her uh, several hours a day to try to get her past this kind of plateau where she's at. But she hasn't really gotten the specific physical therapy for brain trauma that she's needed up until this point. So they're now providing that. So it's a really great opportunity. But you can imagine being in her position where her memory isn't, it's affected. And so you know, Jen's written her notes to, for her to take with her. So she's reminded why she's there, why she's doing this, what she's going through. And so um, they're going to take her tonight and she's going to stay for two weeks. So please pray for her just for peace, you know, that she understands and knows exactly why she's there and works hard during that time so she can get the get over this little hump. Of, of recovery and kind of do better. So that would be great. And then update on my cancer treatment. We've been waiting on my MRD test, which is minimal residual disease. Basically, it's measuring how much cancer is in the blood. And it's kind of a progress report, a checkup. So I'm six months in of a possible two-year uh, treatment plan. And I was exceedingly hopeful that I'm like, well, it's all been going in the right direction. How amazing that would be, Lord, if they found no cancer in the blood, then they could check the bone marrow. If there's none in the bone marrow, then we've reached molecular remission. I could maybe be done with treatment. That's not the case. I am not done. Um, it's still in the blood. It's still there. I'm mean, moving in the right direction. Numbers keep going down. But clearly the cancer is still there. So clearly we have work ahead of us to keep going in this treatment plan. So I'm 25% of the way through and we're going to keep going and trust that God's going to bring us 100% of the way through, right? So your prayers would be greatly, greatly appreciated. All right. With that said, let's jump into God's word together and let's pray. Father, we pray for your blessing on this time. We thank you, Lord, that in your providence, we've come to this passage and this verse today. We trust, Lord, that it is what we need to hear from you. And I pray that you would give us ears to hear. And we thank you for this time. I pray that you would give me the assistance and help I need to speak clearly your truth, not somebody else's opinion, to give your truth clearly, to not add to it or take away. And I pray, Lord, that out of anything preached this morning, that we would remember and hear your truth and your word above all else. We thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for all that you're going to do through the preaching and hearing and doing of your word. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I do want to say I'm very thankful to Pastor Matt Doan, who filled in for me last week, and I hope you enjoyed him. I like having him fill in when he's available because Matt is very different than me and in a good and great way. He's like a drop of sunshine. He's just happy, joyful, 
amazing guy who has so much pastoral experience and things he's been through that he brings that joy with him. So I hope you got to uh, experience that. Hopefully it was a nice breath of fresh air. I can be on the little intense side sometimes, so I want to give you guys a little nice breath of fresh air that Pastor Matt is. So, uh, But with that said, the title this morning is like part two of where we were two weeks ago. The necessity of trials is where Peter was with us in the scriptures. Now it's tested by God. And so I ask you that introductory question, have you been tested by God in your life? Yes. Huh. yes. You have a lot behind those affirmations you just gave that yes, you've been tested. And yet anytime those two words find themselves in a sentence, testing in God, it's almost always portrayed in a highly negative term and sense. That it's never a positive thing. Oh yeah, God's testing me. Isn't that amazing? No, it's why God would you do this to me? Why are you testing me? Why are you torturing me? Why is this happening in my life? And it all is based on a highly negative view of God. Almost seeing him as a sadist. Somebody who delights in the pain of other people. To think that he finds pleasure in our displeasure. That he likes to see us struggle. That he likes to see us in agony. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. We're told that God has revealed himself in the scriptures as being great in compassion towards you. To show empathy to somebody is a godly characteristic. Something that comes from the very nature of God himself. And yet, we sometimes see God negatively, but I want to challenge you to think about people in certain professions that are meant to test you for good reasons. Teachers test your knowledge to measure your progress in a certain area of study. Coaches test your physical and mental endurance to prepare you for competition. Doctors test your body to evaluate your health. And children test your patience to reveal your need of God. <laughs> You see, God is our teacher, and He tests us in order to increase our personal knowledge of Him and His ways. He's also our coach, who puts us into uncomfortable situations, who allows us to face testing in order to produce in us the spiritual, physical, and mental endurance we need to compete at our best. He's also our doctor who allows testings and trials to reveal the condition of our heart and cure that which is sick in us. See, oftentimes it's the difficulties that reveal our need. Where we need to be healed, where we need to be treated. And God uses those things. And all testing in our life is meant to produce in us good things like knowledge, endurance, and patience and that's why Peter pointed out to us in verse 6 of 1 Peter 1, the necessity of our trials. Let's read it together. I'm going to jump to the passage. Why don't you stand with me? We just have a few verses to read and one to study this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1. It's really going to take a long time to get through 1 Peter if I keep doing one verse. <laughs> just to say, it's going to be a long time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may found, be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You can be seated. We'll stop there. So I want us to review a little bit on that verse 6, the necessity of trials. You see, I've, we're called to rejoice in those trials. And here's Peter's reasoning. Rejoice in these trials that you've been grieved for, or grieved in, or by. Why? Because they may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation or the return of Jesus Christ. So that's the purpose of our trials. We rejoice in them because of what they're going to produce in the end. 
I was talking to a buddy about this recently, uh, my buddy Iron Mike. He's, uh, I worked with him at South Coast Toyota back in the day. He watches these messages every Sunday, and we talk about it occasionally. And we were talking about trials and difficulties, which he's had a bunch in his life. And more recently, very, very grievous ones with the loss of his oldest son. But he mentioned, he goes, you know, there's some people in life, and he's a bodybuilder, so that's where his analogies go oftentimes, is he said, there's one guy who can work out legs and push himself so hard that the next day he can barely walk or sit down. And he can't wait to go back and do it again. And then it's the other person, if they do that, they'll never go back again. He said the difference is is the one knows the result and delights in what that pain produces. The other one can't see the result and is not willing to endure the pain to have the good result. Right? Interesting way to put it. And that's how he framed it. But this rejoicing in trials is the mark of a Christian. I watch, you know, different shows with my kids and... um, I'm not a fan of everything Disney does, especially some of the cultural progressive things that they're doing and indoctrinating through their shows, but they own Star Wars. (laughs) And there's been some good series they've come up with recently, one called The Mandalorian. Now, if you know what it is, I don't need to explain it. If you don't know, I'll keep it brief so it doesn't sound nerdy. (laughs) The Mandalorian is basically a show based on this guy who kind of looks like Boba Fett, if you know that from the old movies, okay? Okay. A Mandalorian is somebody who is a part of a clan, this group that lives by a creed and a code that involves armor and the specific type of helmet out of the certain metal that they're not allowed to take off. That's part of the creed. They live by that creed. You don't take it off. You don't show your face to anybody. They also say that part of the creed is that weapons are a part of their religion. And then included in that is always the statement when they talk about the creed and the Mandalorian way of life, they say, this is the way. And another person will reply, this is the way. And the reality is, is as Christians, we have spiritual armor that we all are to wear. Paul talks about it in Ephesians. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, helmet of salvation, all these things, they're a part of who we are as believers for our spiritual battles we face. Not only that, but we have spiritual weapons that are a part of our religion. Faith, hope, and love, and prayer, and worship, all the things that fight against the domain of darkness and Satan's influence in our life and in the lives of others. So we have these weapons of our warfare, Paul says. But then also, we as Christians live by the creed, by God's word, by this way, and this is the way for a Christian to rejoice in trials. It is not an option for those who want to be an overachiever, who want to go above and beyond in their Christian faith, be a saint of some sort. It is for every single common believer like you and me. This is the way we rejoice In our trials. Why? Because we know the result that God will bring from it. Now here's the disclaimer. I know some of what some of you are going through right now. And some of you have some of the most heartbreaking, grievous losses that you are going through right now. That are fresh wounds. Just because we can hear from Scripture the purpose of our pain and suffering, it does not diminish the reality of it. It does not ignore the fact that God grieves with us. That His Word says that He is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. That He comes alongside us in our pain and suffering. He's not a God who's removed from pain and suffering, he came in the person of Christ and experienced it to the full. He knows every single thing you are going through and can relate to it. That's why he can pray for us so effectively. That's why he can help us through it efficiently. Because he knows what we are going through. And he is with us in the midst of it. And so as we walk through these difficulties and trials, He is there. Now, your life might be great right now. Don't be one of those persons who their life is blessed right now, so good, and then you hear a message like this and you start to feel guilty for having a great life. No, no. You're going through a great season. Enjoy all of it. 
Praise God for it and, and just take advantage of every moment and yet tuck away these truths and look back on your life when you did have difficulties and see how God's used it and look forward to the future on how you are going to handle those trials when they come. But don't feel bad about going through an amazing season of life and some of you are going through it. And some of you are going through a great time but you see it as a bad time. Maybe we need a little better perspective. Maybe we need to see our circumstances in light of God's truth rather than our emotions, right? We need some measure of thankfulness through these things. But it's interesting that these trials and sufferings, they are our teachers. And they teach us invaluable lessons for our life of faith. And suffering, which trials create, the definition means this, the state of undergoing pain and distress or hardship. And some of you are like, that's the definition of my life right now. That's okay. God's with you in it. And it won't be that way forever. That's when people lose heart. When they think the difficulty is permanent. Or forever. You're like, well, I've got a chronic disease or disorder or chronic pain. So it's forever in my lifetime. Yes, but it's not forever, forever. It's not forever for eternity. You will be delivered from those pains at the return of Christ or at your exaltation when you go home to be with the Lord. It is not forever. It is short-lived. And we'll get back to that a little later. But we have a problem in our culture. We avoid pain at all cost. All discomfort, all difficulty, all pain, we try to eradicate it. I wonder how many of you own this item, painkillers. We all do. And praise God that he has allowed humanity to develop medication that helps deal with excessive pain. Can we all agree that is a great thing? Right? Many people are going, I don't know how I would have survived in the old days. I don't either. The reality is, is God has allowed those things to help us endure some of the pain we face. But can... People take something meant to treat physical pain and use it to try to numb emotional pain. To take a substance of some sort to get them to avoid what's going on under the surface. You see, in 2017, so a few years ago, healthcare providers in the United States wrote more than 191 million prescriptions for opioid pain medication. That's more than half our population. That is one opioid prescription for every other person in this nation. That's a lot. Now, some of those are rightly prescribed. Some of those are not. You have over 11 million people in 2017 abused opioids. 11 million. Then you add their immediate family and you've got upwards of 50, 60 million people being impacted on a daily basis by a substance addiction like opioids. 60 million people. That's quite a problem, is it not? And it's the numbing of pain and yet pain can serve a good purpose. For example... Let's say that you had shoulder surgery. Your surgeon screwed up. They nicked a, a bundle of nerves and you have no feeling in your left arm. Right? None. Can't feel pain. Can't feel anything. And you decide you wake up in the morning and you want to make some eggs and bacon, which I love to do in the morning. Got the, the griddle there and you start heating it up and you decide to, to lean against the counter. And you're just thinking, you're off in la-la land thinking about your day. And you hear the sizzling of the bacon in the pan and you're smelling it and it just smells different. <laughs> and you look down and it's not the bacon. It's your left hand. That you decided to rest unknowingly on that griddle. And now because your pain receptors are gone, your hand is irreparably damaged and you can't use it at all. Pain tells you, ow, move, stop doing this, do something different, change what you're doing, don't do that. And yet, we want to numb the pain and keep doing what we're doing. 
How many people are living a sinful life which causes pain and distress in our life and the lives of others, and yet we numb that pain with false teaching, with substance abuse and other things, so that we don't change because of the pain. We just keep going in it and numb ourselves from it. That's insanity. Pain, if we pay attention to it, will tell us to move our hand when we need to. To move ourselves to get out of that circumstance and do things differently. Or it's going to cause irreparable damage. You see, pain serves a purpose. Not only does it tell us when to move, when to act, when to do things different, but it also teaches us obedience. It causes us to become more like Christ in our life. And it shows us our great need of Him. Now our trials may cause deep pain, but they are an opportunity for God to be glorified. Jesus told us that we are the light of the world and a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. That we're not to take a lamp and put it under a bowl, but we put it on its stand. Suffering and difficulty and trials in your life are a lampstand. And you may not want to be put on it, but sometimes you don't have a choice. And you are put on a lampstand of suffering so that the light of Christ could be shown through your life to others. Could it be that somebody else's eternal salvation is more important than your physical comfort? Did Jesus undergo physical pain for our eternal happiness? So for his followers, could it be possible that we could go through physical pain for the spiritual good of others? Right? It brings an amazing purpose and a noble reality to our difficulties. That God has called us worthy to suffer through those things for Him. Now, once again, pain is not pleasant. None of us like it, but the darker the trials, the brighter the light of Christ can shine through us. Trials draw us to Christ. Turn to Psalm 34. We're going to get to the testing of our faith in a moment. I'll wrap up this trial section. Psalm 34, 15. If any of you are ever sick and I visit you in the hospital, you will probably hear Psalm 34 because it's one of my favorites. And it starts with talking about testing and seeing that the Lord is good. And the context is great difficulty and trials. That God is good in the midst of those. And then he says this in verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. One of the biggest lies that Satan whispers to you and I is that God doesn't see you and God doesn't hear you. Well, that's exactly the opposite of what God's word declares in verse 15. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. He sees you and he hears you. That's an amazing comfort. Not only that, it says the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. So those who do not know Christ. Yet when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And here's the kicker. Listen carefully to see if this is your theology of trials in the Christian life. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. When you heard the gospel and you accepted Christ, did you understand that your afflictions might be many? (laughs) Or did they sell you a product that said, oh, believe in Jesus, pray this prayer, and your life will be so much better and easier? Uh, Sometimes it's harder. Sometimes it's more difficult because God has great work for you and I to do. And it's a great honor and privilege to face those difficulties. Now, none of us like them. But you can look back on some of those and be thankful for them. You can be going through them presently and rejoice in the Lord for what he's going to do because of them in your life and the life of others. Do you ever pray for your children's salvation if you have kids or your grandkids? What if that suffering and difficulty you're going through is going to result in their salvation? Would you go through it with joy? And pray for my kids often, not often enough, but I pray for them often. And I think about them and their future. And I want certain things for them. 
And one of the things I want is I want them to know their Heavenly Father and the salvation He's given us in Christ. The greatest thing I can do is not prepare them for college. It's to prepare them for this life, to know Christ and enjoy Him forever in eternity with Him. It's about time we as parents start focusing on really what makes sense. Careers are important. Education of all kinds is important. All of those are tools towards their future. But is it worth losing eternity because you're focusing on those and their sports too much? When the things that really matter are eternal and unseen? We need to prepare our kids for the right season of life. The future one. With that said, we look at faith and the testing of it. We experience trials and we rejoice in them. Why? So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You have three parts to this verse. You have the tested genuineness of faith. You have it being more precious than gold and being tested by fire. And then you have the result of genuine faith, praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now here's the reality. This testing that happens in the Greek, it means to test, to put to proof, to examine, to assay metals. What does to assay metals mean? It means actually the testing of a metal or or to determine its ingredients and quality. Your faith is being equated to a certain type of metal. Humanity has found ways to make many useful things out of steel and metals of all kinds. Now, I used an example a couple weeks ago about, from knife making about sharpening a knife. And in the right hands of a craftsman, they take that knife and they put it against a grinding wheel, which that's what our trials are like. And our life is that knife that in the hands of God, he puts it against that grinding wheel. He shapes the edge, sharpens it, and makes it very useful. That's what God will do with our trials and difficulties. But in the wrong hands like ours, that trial, that grinding wheel can be destructive and cause damage to us and our usefulness. So we trust ourselves into the hands of the craftsman for God to sharpen us through those trials and difficulties. Now, there's another example from knife making that when you have a knife made out of steel of some kind, it's usually raw. And that raw steel, you can shape it easier, but it's not going to hold an edge. It's not going to be durable. That thing is not tested. We were just at an off-road race called King of the Hammers a couple weeks ago. And Joey, my oldest, had some money burning a hole in his pocket. And there was a fabricator there who was showing some of what they could do on off-road vehicles. And one of their examples was they, he made a series of hatchets out of raw steel and you could buy them for 20 bucks. So Joey bought one and it's a really cool shape and design, but it's raw steel. And so he can still use it, but the edge isn't going to hold up and it's not durable whatsoever. So how do you make that steel durable? You put it in a kiln and you heat it up extremely hot, glowing hot, and then you take it out of the fire and you quench it in oil. And that process of heating and quenching ends up causing the molecules of the steel to bond together and to harden. So it actually makes the, the steel itself able to hold an edge longer. It has rigidity, so it's not going to break. And it actually has some flexibility to it too that helps it in durability as well. Our faith is like that steel. Untested, it's okay. We, we have faith, but it's not durable. It hasn't been tempered and hardened to endure more rigorous testing. And so when you face a trial, God is heating up your life and then using the Holy Spirit to quench it and causing that cycle of heating and cooling to create the strength in your faith that is needed for the trials and testing ahead. It's an amazing thing that we see in different elements of life and other examples. But why would our faith be tested? This verse answered it. That it may, it may result 
in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whose praise, whose glory, whose honor? It's actually yours. In context. That your faith would result in God praising and glorifying and honoring that faith at His coming. Rather than you being ashamed and lost at His return, you are exalted to the right hand of Christ to sit down and rule and reign with Him. Talk about glory and honor. Genuine faith results in that genuine reward. And here's the problem today. A lot of people profess faith in Jesus, but the evidence isn't there. Their faith hasn't been tested and proven to be genuine. How many of us know individuals who professed a faith in Christ, trials and difficulties came, and they maybe were in ministry, they were maybe pastors, whatever it may be, and suddenly they aren't even believers anymore. You see, that faith they professed was tested. And the conclusion would be it wasn't genuine. Or if it was, I believe that God in His time will restore that faith and restore that individual in His grace. But we've seen those who when they need faith the most, they let it go. I just watched a video, it's fascinating, Ice Climber. And he's going up a frozen waterfall. I mean, that's pretty intense, right? He's got the, the spikes on his boots. He's got the ice picks. And he's at near the top, the crest of this frozen waterfall. And the frozen river came through this little valley area with trees on every side. And you could see it's frozen. He's near the top and he's got a drone that is following him. So it's this amazing footage. And all of a sudden something caused an avalanche to run down the frozen river. He's on the waterfall. So where's it going to go? Right on top of him. And here he is bearing down, trying to get another ice pick set as this snow is just rushing and clashing into him and he's hundreds of feet off the ground. He is solo climbing. There's nobody around. And he is hanging on and he, he posts in the caption, I almost didn't post this video, but it was so insane of a thing to live through, I had to post it. And he said, it took every ounce of my strength to stay calm and hold on to my tools. And he held on and he had the composure to know this can't last forever. It's going to stop at some point. So just hold on a little longer. Well, some Christians, when they face trials unexpected, they're like that ice climber and they just go, this is too hard. I'm going to let go of my tools. I'm going to give into it. I'm going to go over the edge. I'm done for. But he held on and he knew I just got to hold on a little bit more. And he endured that difficulty. Do you know what that did for his confidence? To be able to survive something like that? Well, he had been tried and tested solo climbing before that that prepared him to stay calm in the midst of that great difficulty. How many of us get in trouble when we stop and we lose calm? We start to freak out and we give in to the fears and the lies. You know, I've been listening through uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit with the kids in the truck. We finished the Chronicles of Narnia. Now we're to Tolkien and we're listening to The Hobbit. And it reminds me of a section in The Lord of the Rings where there's the evil wizard named Sauron who serves the Lord of the Rings. No, sorry, not Sauron. Saruman was the bad guy who served the really bad guy, the Lord of the Rings. Well, he had been stripped of all his power, but all the good guys are like, but he still has his voice. Don't even give an ear to his words or he will sway you. Which he ends up doing to a couple in their party. And you see, Satan is like that. He has been stripped of his power by the cross of Christ, but he still has his voice. And any who give ear to his lying words will get swayed in due time. We have to guard ourselves from listening to the lies of the enemy and the things that he tells us about God that aren't true. So how do we combat the voice of the devil? With the word of God. We have to take it in. We've got to put it into our life or else Satan's voice starts sounding a lot like our own. We start believing things and we start being convinced that, you know what? We're just going to perish anyways. Let go of those tools of faith. No one's going to save me. No one's going to come for me. 
all lies. The reality is, is Christ has tethered us to the rock with the safety line of the Holy Spirit. So even in those times of great weakness, and we may even let go of those tools of faith momentarily, the Holy Spirit catches us because we're tethered to the rock who is Christ. And we're encouraged to pick up those tools again and keep climbing. That's what God has created us to do and be. To endure the testing. To not crumble in the midst of it. And so yes, our faith is tested, but does God do the testing? Now, I didn't say this in first service, but I'll qualify it here. There's a difference between testing and tempting. God does not tempt us with evil. We get that from James 1.13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. The other thing I want to say about this is that not all difficulties are God testing you. Let me say that again. Not all difficulties are God's test. Some difficulties are just a part of a fallen world we live in. The death of your loved one, not necessarily God deciding to test you. We live in a world where sin, sickness, and death still exist. And so it's a part of our life and experience here on earth. Some difficulties are just a part of our fallen choices. They're consequences of disobedience. And so we're going through a difficulty. You might think, why is God testing me? No, it's why did you make that decision? That's the real question for you and I. Why did we make that decision that has brought this present difficulty? But then sometimes difficulties are extraordinary, unique, and intended by God for a great purpose. Abraham, I wanted to know if God tested people. I looked it up. The first example of testing is Genesis 22.1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. God tested Abraham. And the testing being referred to is when Abraham had to sacrifice his son Isaac. God spared him from actually doing it, but Abraham had to be willing to actually sacrifice his son, which he was about to do. That is extraordinary. It wasn't like that was a daily test where Isaac wakes up and he's like, okay, my dad's going to have to sacrifice me again. That wasn't a daily testing. It was extraordinary. It was unique. And there are events in your life, I believe, that are unique and extraordinary where God is testing you. I can look back on my life and I can look at some of the things I shared with you two weeks ago where I can see that God was testing me for a good purpose, to strengthen my faith, not to weaken it, to provide blessing in my life, not cursing. So there are times where God does test you as a teacher or a coach or a doctor where he does those things. But not every difficulty is, is God testing you, but every difficulty will test you. Everything you face, whether it's common to our life experience, whether it's a result of bad choices, or whether it's God actually testing you, they will all test your faith to strengthen it and hopefully not diminish it. If we allow God to have that work in us. You want to know if other people were tested in Scripture? Look at anybody in it. From Abraham, who was tested by offering up Isaac, to Joseph, who was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, believed to be dead by his father, falsely accused by his master's wife, falsely imprisoned for upwards of 14 years, forgotten in jail, and then miraculously freed and exalted to the right hand of Pharaoh. He would have not become the leader he, he was to save God's people if he did not go through the trials and difficulties of the previous years. You would not be the person you are today without those trials and difficulties. And they are the things that have blessed you more than anything else. The pain and difficulties bring about eternal reward and blessing. And we need to keep that in focus. Moses faced all kinds of difficulties. The Israelites, when they were given the Ten Commandments, God said that he came to test them to see if they would walk in his law or not. So do you think we could be facing difficulties where God wants to see if you're going to actually obey him? If you're going to follow him? I forget what one of my kids did the other day, but I 
presented what I wanted of them and they watched to see if they were going to actually do it. I had a feeling they weren't going to. That they weren't going to walk in what I asked of them and they didn't. I mean, they're, they're kids. They do that at times because they're like me. They're like their dad. I don't always do what God would ask me to do. And I watched and I, sure enough, I wanted to see if when nobody's looking, would they keep my word? This kid didn't that day. And it reminded me of myself. But God sometimes allows us difficulties to see how we'll handle them. Right? But here you have a situation where, I mean, you look at Job. God's like, hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. He lost everything and we, he was tested tremendously. Why? Because God saw something in him. God thought so highly of him that God allowed him to be tested. Wow. God, you don't have to think of us that highly. Right? He lost all his children, all his wealth, and all his health all in one day. And he still didn't curse God and die like his wife told him to. I mean, talk about an encouraging spouse. You lose all that, and she goes, you know, just curse God and die. Let go of those tools. Just fall off the cliff, man. And yet he still didn't. And he trusted God and he was blessed for it. What's interesting is that through Job's testing, the purpose of his trials, James 5.11 tells us, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast, you know, who still held on in faith. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. That's what we are supposed to see from Job's life. All that he lost, all that God restored, we are supposed to see that God is compassionate and merciful. When was the last time you heard a preacher display that character of God through Job's life? That God is compassionate and merciful, and that's why Job went through what he did, and that's why God restored everything twofold. I think we've gotten Job's story a little wrong. But our faith is more precious than gold, it says. Another analogy for metalwork. And here's the reality with that. When you pull and mine gold out of a mountainside, it has impurities of all kinds. It has lead and iron and other things mixed in. And so the goldsmith takes that raw material and he heats it up to the point where that solid becomes a liquid. He melts the metal and what it causes is the impurities and the other elements in the gold come to the surface. And those impurities are skimmed off and the goldsmith lets it cool down. What does he do next? Heats it up again. He repeats the cycle of heating and testing, causing it to melt under the heat. Impurities come up, skims it off, cools it down again and again and again until it is pure gold. That's how your faith and mine is. God allows the fiery trials to heat up and melt the substance of our faith so that the impurities the things that need to be removed from our life come to the surface. We acknowledge them. We say, God, I, that's ugly. That should not be in my life. I need, I need you to skim that off, please. And then he'll allow a time of cooling where that fiery trial has subsided for a time. And then he'll let, let another one come to allow those impurities to come out so that our faith will result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, when you go through trials and difficulties, I'll end with this example. Huh, two examples. <laughs> Maybe I'll add a third. Who knows? We face trials and it can cause us to be insecure about future difficulties or can give us confidence for the future. The other day I walked into the jujitsu gym that I train at, which I haven't been able to do for six months now, going through this cancer treatment. And it's owned by my buddy, Benil Dariush, who is a current UFC fighter. He's number three in the world, and he has a huge fight coming up Saturday. This was this last Wednesday. I stopped in, and immediately when I came through the door, there was tension in the room. 
There were fighters sparring on both sides, but Benny's standing in this doorway and he's got his bare foot on a frozen bottle, waddle, waddle bottle, <laughs> water bottle. And I could see someone was wrong. And usually he greets me, gives me a big hug. He's just quiet and this guy's talking to him. And he looks at me and he goes, Pastor, can you hand me my phone? And so I grab the phone and I give it to him and he calls his wife. And my buddy Josh, who I was having lunch with, uh, he came over and he goes, Benny just, just hurt his leg. And uh, we prayed for him and he went off to the doctors and he ended up injuring his leg severely to where he can't fight. He's been working 15 years towards this goal. Whoever wins this fight that he has will most likely get a title shot, which he's never had yet. And he's been working towards it against a very skilled opponent. And now he doesn't get paid. He spent months training for this, and now he's got to be months in recovery. Talk about a devastating turn of events. And yet, he is good in the midst of this great difficulty. He said to my buddy Josh, because I texted with Josh, I said, hey, how's he doing today? And he goes, he actually said, he's good, and no, I'm not on drugs. <laughs> like, he's, he's doing good. Like, God has given him great peace, knowing, and what my buddy, buddy Josh, who's a pastor, told him right before he went to the doctor, he said, remember, Benny, God puts you in situations to test your mental toughness and prepare you for greater things. So this is a great opportunity to grow in your faith. And that's how he views it. What a disappointment. But he is going to be a far better fighter and so much more good is going to come out of this than if he was able to fight this coming Saturday. If he gets the belt one day, it's going to be because of this difficulty he went through right now. When he gets that success that maybe God has for him. We'll see. But when we went to the desert recently, this is my last story, I promise. We had an eventful trip. Um, Haven fractured her wrist again, which the first time was through dirt bike riding. That's same thing. Second time, but then Landon, right when we were packing up, he was playing with his friend and they were on a hillside a little far from camp and he successfully found a broken bottle under the sand. He put his hand down. It was just under the surface and he lacerated his palm near his thumb area real deep um, into the meat section so it's a good one and he's he's bleeding pretty good so we put some pressure on it look at it oh yep yeah, that's a good one uh, Jen throws a bunch of hydrogen peroxide in it and keep the pressure on it we get the blood to stop try to go to the fire station down the road uh, to get them to clean it better firemen were gone what's up firemen <laughs> the, you know, and those are the guys who are always supposed to be there they're apparently out on a call or something and uh, so we went home, made a long trip home. Hours later, took him to the urgent care. And as we get there, I'm a little concerned for him because when he was, he's 10 now, when he was seven, he had a similar experience and he just freaked out. And it was one of those like dad holding the kid and the kid going, daddy, make him stop, make him stop, yelling and screaming, awful, right? So I'm going, okay, here we go. What's going to be? And the nurse is checking him out, doing his vitals. And the physician's assistant comes by and he goes, okay, I'm going to put this numbing gel on it, right? And I'm thinking, okay, that's good. He goes to put it on and land starts freaking out. I'm like, oh, not going to be good. And he puts it on. And we're like, buddy, it's just cold. Like, it's okay. Like probably burning a little bit, but you're all right. So he calmed down. And then I had a conversation with him because the PA used the word shot. And it's like, okay, how am I going to handle, prepare my son for this difficulty, right? What am I going to tell him? Am I going to lie to him? Because I don't believe God lies to us. And so he asked me, he goes, dad, is it going to hurt? Just like we would ask the Lord, God, is this going to hurt? And I said, yes. I said, buddy, it's going to hurt. I said, but it's going to hurt for a short time. And so you have to be ready to growl, grit, yell, do whatever you have to do, but no, it's not going to be forever. It's going to be a short pain and it's going to be little so you don't have to experience big pain. I said, would you rather have little pain for a short time or big pain for a long time? He's like, little pain, short time. Good. I said, okay, so he's going to bring it and I said, it's going to hurt and he's going to shoot it, but that's to numb it so you don't feel the stitches. He's like, okay, 
And I'm trying to distract him. I've got the new episode of Boba Fett on my phone trying to get him to watch it. He, he's not paying attention. He's like, you know, looking at it. And so I got him and I'm holding his face. I'm like, buddy, don't, don't look at it because blood's just as he's, and I thought three or four shots. I lost count. It was upwards of 12. And it was in the open wound and it was bad. And he's, He's, he's crying and he's hurting, but he's not freaking out. Like he was just gritting down and, and taking it. I mean, I was really impressed. And he got done and he goes, Dad, is it done? I said, yeah, it's done. And then he goes to, to suture it. And he starts with the first, first one and Landon goes, I don't feel it. I'm like, that's good. And so then he starts watching Boba Fett, right? And then so one stitch down, two stitch, three, he gets to four. And Landon kind of twinges a little bit. Mm, guy keeps going. He finishes it. Gets to the fifth one. He pokes him. And he goes, ow! And he goes, oh, buddy, I missed that corner. I got to give you another shot. And he goes, nope. <laughs> I'm like, you want him to just keep going? He goes, yeah, just, just do it. And so he did that last one where he felt it. And he just got through it. Here's what I wanted for my son. I didn't want an experience where now he would be scared of needles and scared of pain and all these things for the rest of his life. I wanted him to be able to look back on this experience, the one when he was seven and how he's grown and look at it now and go, man, I made it through that. Like I fit, I, that, that was awful and that hurt, but I can get through that. I know I can face pain and difficulty in the future. And that's how your trials and difficulties should be. You shouldn't be scared of them coming in your life, but they should give you confidence for what God is going to do in enabling you to endure that difficulty. That just as that ice climber, many trials before enabled him to hold on during that avalanche, you need those trials of the past to help you to hold on now. And know that God is holding you when you can't hold on any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, you will face difficulty in this life, but Christ has overcome this world and this experience. He is coming back for you and me, and he has meant that your faith would be tested, that it would be durable and strong, and you'd be equipped for every difficulty and painful situation you may endure. But don't numb the pain. Don't avoid it, but face it and be truthful about it. But know that your heavenly father is with you. And that was the determining factor for my son as he wasn't left all alone. He wasn't lied to and tricked. He was told the truth. Me being his dad, I was there with him, holding him. Man, I was sweating like I was going through it with him. And I believe our heavenly father is going through it with you. And you need to know that he's with you. And that's why I love that Joshua 1.9 so much. Is we're to be strong and courageous. Not fear or be dismayed. Why? For the Lord our God is with us wherever we go. He is with us in the pain. He can relate to it. He can help us overcome it. And we need to know that it's for a short time. It's not going to be forever. Your difficulties are not eternal. But your joy and happiness will be in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the good and the blessing you bring through our difficulties. We thank you, Lord, that if we've been through them, we know that our faith has been tested, that hopefully proven to be genuine and real and vibrant. And so, Lord, I pray that you would strengthen and purify our faith, that you would temper it in the fiery trials, that you would purify it, and that, Lord, you would enable it to result in praise and glory and honor at your second coming. But, Lord, we thank you that you are with us in the midst of our difficulties. And may we, Lord, know how compassionate and kind you are towards us through them. And may we trust you in all of it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, because of short time, why don't we stand for the blessing? And our worship team will sing us out. But I just want to encourage you in this closing moment that you know a thing or two about difficulty and trials. You've gone through pain and suffering in your life. And all of it is meant to be a reference point for the future. A training ground to prepare you to overcome anything that may come in the future. So don't fear those things. But be realistic about them. Recognize them when they're present. And recognize God's means of overcoming them. And that's faith and trust in Him. 
that you can endure anything that God allows in your life. When you start thinking that this is never going to end, that's when you lose hope. But when you know that it's for a short time, that it, and you might be thinking, well, I have chronic pain or I have a chronic disease. It's going to be this way for the rest of my life. Maybe it will. But it's going to end one day. That pain and that difficulty is not going to be forever. You have eternal joy and happiness, not eternal sickness to look forward to. And so no matter how long that difficulty may seem in this life, it's not forever. And you can endure it and you can trust Him to carry you through it. Amen? So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. God bless you guys. Love you all. Thanks for coming.